Um, I had more stuff I wanted to read to you. <laughs> Maybe we've taken in enough stuff. A, a number of people have come to speak to me individually, and the general, what I hear is that almost everyone is completely exhausted. You know? We're either on the verge of a burnout or we're emerging from a burnout. <laughs> everyone, I mean, I just, I don't know, is there anyone who's not? Any? Okay. No, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> I forgot. What did you say? <laughs> so, so I thought it, it, would, it would be... So this is completely unrehearsed at this point. I feel like we need some Quran. Do you mind? I'm inspired for Inshira, but maybe there's something more. Alam Nashra, As you like, but I thought we have have people speak to each other eventually. So if you, but maybe it's better in a circle, Sheikh. What? Shall we make a circle? We can still speak to each other in a circle. Oh, the Sheikh is usually right. Eh? <laughs> so can we make a big circle? It's, it's, um, maybe we all would like to see you clearly. Yeah, yes. And maybe okay. it's easier to see you. Well, and to see different. each other. I want to. It's yeah, about each yeah. other. But it's easier to see you as well. Mm. If we sit in a circle, we can see you and each other. It, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So can we make a circle? There is a. Aoudhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alam nashrah laka sadrak Wa wadha'na anka wizrak Alladhi anqadha dhahrak Wa rafa'na laka dhikrak فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَى رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ اللهم صلي على محمد Sadaq Allah al-Azim. Shaykh Muslim, would you mind translating that surah for us? Tell us what it says. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yusuf was reading Surah Al-Insharah. Surah, the name of the surah is Al-Insharah, meaning the, the opening of the chest, or the expansion of the chest. And Allah Jalla wa'ala says in this surah, Have we not expanded for you 
your chest. And removed from you the burden that nearly broke your back. And we have elevated for you your remembrance, your dhikr. So know that with every hardship comes ease. With every hardship comes ease. So when you are free from your daily tasks, turn towards your Lord and apply yourself to him. Stand up and turn towards your Lord and apply yourself to him. Um, at one point, Sheikh Fadada translated this word Rabb. And the I, I'm not a very good listener. So sometimes when the Sheikh speaks, somebody says, What did he say? And I go, Ah. <laughs> but I remembered this. <laughs> so. Um, said Rub was that which gives everything in creation, everything that it needs in every moment for its perfection. So that's what we are invited to turn towards. <laughs> and Raqib, Marakaba. I earnestly, I don't believe anything is, uh, happens by accident, but I suspect each of the people that I've met here, I feel that you're like seeds that Allah has planted in the earth of the dunya, in the madness of this world that we've created. And that each of you, through your nearness, and through your witnessing, just through who you are, will change what's going on around you. And that's uh, not an easy task. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a trust. It's a big trust. Um, but it's important to understand that I have found it important for me to understand. I was in Detroit in the the capital of dystopia. <laughs> I, it was important for me to understand that it wasn't that I had to do something. <laughs> I mean, we do all have to do. But when the Prophet ﷺ, he spent most of his life fighting. I didn't realize that. But somebody told me that if you actually look at the time of his prophecy, the time of his prophecy, he was battling all of the time, you know, not that he wanted to, but there was opposition to the light and the truth and the beauty that he brought. He was constantly facing the opposition. It wasn't comfortable. And it's a bit like that now, I think. I don't know how you feel. <laughs> he was like, whoa, this is Mecca. <laughs> or maybe Medina sometime too. So, but, you know, in a battle, when they were outnumbered, he threw, and they won. And Allah said, when you threw, it was not you who threw it. I threw it. So what we're invited to, I believe, with this robe of nearness, this marakaba, this nearness, this witnessing that we've been invited to, that we've been given guidance to, that we say we want, that we say we believe, is the opportunity to submit totally and trust totally that even though it looks like chaos, this situation, this is Allah's decree, and it's, it's Allah's story, and our job is just to witness and do our best, and the best will come from it, because Allah, the light will shine through us, and the truth will be manifest 
from us and around us. And our job is to submit and trust. And just that simple shift from, I have to carry my responsibilities and I have to do, to standing, witnessing and trusting can make a big difference in how you are physically. Because then you take to tie moat from Allah's effulgence, from Rab, you witness that right now I have everything that I need in this moment, for the perfection of this moment. It's here for me, it's available, I have it. And just being <coughs> conscious of your breath and conscious of your connection to heaven and earth and conscious of your connection to your heart, your root, can help you to be a witness and be aware that you have what you need. Whatever, it's energy or relaxation or rest or space or to be understood. Allah's Rabb, it's a promise. It's a promise. Um, there's a, <laughs> I think from Jafar Sadiq about takbir, he has something about each aspect of the prayer. And when I read it, I was like, oops. <laughs> and then I thought, I can't read this to other people. They would, you know, it would be too serious for them. They won't, they won't, uh, they'll be offended. But I think I have to read it, and if I can just find it. Um, well, I'll read a couple. When you face the Qibla, you should despair of this world, what it contains of creation, what others are occupied with, and empty your heart of every preoccupation which might distract you from Allah. See the immensity of Allah with your innermost being and remember that you will stand before him. For Allah has said, There shall every soul become acquainted with what it sent before and they shall be brought back to Allah, their true patron. And patron perhaps, is it Rabbit there? Or I wonder Mawla. Mawla, the true Mawla. Anta Mawlana, Fonsuna, la Kamil Kathleen. Um... Stand at the foot of fear and hope. Do you know this about the two sandals? That one foot goes with, with uh, fear, which is uh, taqwa, fearful awareness, and the other with hope. So every time we step, we step with these two things. Yeah. When you recite the takbir, Allahu Akbar, we say it all the time, right? Okay. You should belittle what is between the high heavens and the moist earth, which are all below, his glory. For when Allah looks into the heart of his bondsman while he is saying takbir, and sees in the heart something obstructing the truth of his declaring that Allah is great, he says, O oh liar, do you try to deceive me? <laughs> By my might and majesty, I'll deny you the sweetness of our remembrance and I'll veil you from my nearness and from joy and my intimate communion. <laughs> so you say, Allahu Akbar, and Allah says, you lying. <laughs> so you could be upset at this, but when I read it, I went, yeah, a lot of the time I am lying. <laughs> you know? Because I'm saying Allahu Akbar and I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that and I'm giving power to this and I'm saying, oh, it's too bad that that's happening, and those people over there, they always... And I'm giving power to practically everything except the law. So, to, it, it's... There's a, a, an American black woman so, triple darkness. <laughs> um, and she said, Fanny Mae Hammer was her name, and she said, my being well is an act of rebellion. So, 
we very often feel that the union, the, the corporations, and the government, and all of those others, you know, <laughs> that they have, their, we're against them. They're the there, and we're the us, and we want to rebel against them and the apparent power they have over us, blah, 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 blah. But to actually, this, this witnessing that we're speaking about now, that we've been working on all of this time, that we practice in the prayer, because what we're working on is salat to him daimu. Right? Translation. To be in a state of salat all of the time. So the prayer is practice to be witnessing all the time. Yes, it's the goal. <laughs> so when we're in the office in front of the computer listening to somebody that's been tortured or we're you know, dealing with somebody that's cheating someone and we have to somehow not tell them or you know, the stuff that we do or we're dealing with children, a lot of teachers who are dealing with children that have terrible things happening at home and they're, they're not happy and they're not well but you're under pressure that you have to get this kid to learn this stuff and do and it's, it's crazy, it's crazy the world we're in right now, the pressure you're under. So when we're, when, when we're in, that, in that place, it's really important if we can... Allahu Akbar. A real talk there. Yeah. And really trusting that Allah's rub, and though it doesn't seem to be great, Allah's got it. Mm-hmm. And He's got me. <laughs> So, I, I studied Qigong with a, a man who didn't actually know very much about Allah, nothing about Allah. He was a communist youth. And I demonstrated the positions of the prayer for him, and he said, that's a perfect Qigong. And um, uh, he told me that the strongest Qigong masters, the ones that he would wish he could study with, were in the southern part of China, and they were all Muslims. And they were the people of the greatest knowledge in terms of mastering energy and the movement of energy and life, how to live well on this earth. And he wished that he was a Muslim and that, he, that they would teach him, because, and he was already a great master himself. So. I, I'm trying to say that we've been given something really powerful, <laughs> really powerful, and it will absolutely allow us to master living this life, even at this difficult time, if we do it com- with complete faith and with complete submission and trust, have what we need. So the Qigong master, uh, taught me how to uh, prepare to do Qigong. And it was how to clear, um, I forgot the word that you used, but to hear, clear the garbage from my brain. <laughs> something like some rather not polite word from my brain. Um, before I even started to try to face the creator of the universe. You know? But to do Qigong is actually the same thing. But when I t- tried to talk to him about Allah, he said, well, when you talk about this Allah, it, it sounds to me like chi. <laughs> so what he taught me was that you should do what I consider, you know, like I said, this was a portable sajda. Well, this is a portable guzu. <laughs> okay. So what he taught me is that you should stand because our place as human beings um, Sons of Adam and Hawa. Our place between is to connect heaven and earth. We're the barzak. We're the space between the unseen and the seen, between the material and the subtle. It's, it's our job. But also between heaven and earth, between the yang energy in heaven and the yin energy in earth. Yin energy in earth, every place outside of us, when you pour water, it goes down, fire goes up. In us, it goes the other way. 
So we need to take our place between heaven and earth. And I believe that that's what kiyam is, when you stand, that's, that's what you're doing. But when, when you do kiyam, before you do shigum, ch- uh, you make sure that these points right at the bottom of your foot, that your weight is right in the middle of your foot, and that you're there, you actually stand on your feet. I had operations on my knees, so when I stand, I kind of put my knees together and I'm not really connecting to the earth. So you might find that you don't really connect. Have to check. And you balance the weight on both sides and you have the same distance between your shoulders and your feet. And then you connect to heaven. And I was working with this beautiful young man today who has been carrying so much burden of the the suffering of this earth by working with other people who have been tortured and hurt badly but in life. And his whole being is like this because he's like carrying this weight on his shoulders. And so it's really important that you can shrug the dunya off your shoulders and actually take your place between heaven and earth so that you're this channel between the two. So you just imagine that there's this place at the top of your head that opens like a lotus to receive energy from Allah, that it's actually facing up to the earth, the top of your head. You find it by putting your fingers on your ears. Where these two fingers meet, that's the top. And you want that to actually, as if there were a golden string hanging from heaven. And your whole spine is hanging from that string. And when you do that, if you pull a hair up, if you have one there, <laughs> if you pull a hair up, you'll see that your chin goes down a little bit and the back of your head just kind of sits on top of your spine. That's what you want. And your tongue just naturally rests behind your front teeth. As if you're saying, Allah. So just to, it's like you become an alif. If that makes some sense. Hmm? You see that? And then you, you know, a Muslim will say to us, and then connect to this place under your heart, you know? So what he's inviting us to is to be aware that our intention is so strong that we can give our attention and intention to a place. We can intend to go to a place in our body and intend that something happens there, and it will happen. The Chinese says, qi follows yi, that this life energy will follow your attention. And this is very important to understand. So I invite you to intend that this, like a ray of light that's coming down right to the top of your head, that it's going to go right down the front of your body. And as it moves down, it's going to relax the muscles. Whatever tension is there, you can feel the tension and then let it go. And you just pay attention to the front of your body. Oops, some tension in the diaphragm. Let it go. Keep going down, past the knees, all the way down the toes and the feet, and let it go. Will you stand? Will you join me? So feet the shoulder width apart. You plug in to the earth. And then you plug into heaven. And you're probably going to be standing farther back than you usually are, because most of us are like this from the phones and the computer. And your chin is going to be down a little bit, like the little hook on the alif. And then the point is straight up. And let your tongue rest on the top of your mouth, and that relaxes your jaw. And this just... Here I am, Lord. It's, it's, you're upright, but you're submitted to this place of standing. And then we just, as you like, allow the light to come through. And just let your attention go from the top of your head to your eyes. There's a tension in my forehead. As I breathe out, I just let it go. Breathe in again, move a little bit further down. Test, ooh, a little bit tension in my chest. When I breathe out, I let it go. 
And just let your tension in your own speed go right through your whole body. Tension in the calves, the knees, the tops of the feet, the toes. And just let whatever no longer serves you, just let it flow right out into the earth. Like we let the water from the wuzu go back to the earth. She'll send back flowers. <coughs> and then we do the same thing from the back of the head. Again, just let, you can imagine water, healing water, grace, light, a color if you like, whatever works for you. <coughs> They're all attributes of Allah's mercy. Everything's attributes of Allah's mercy. And just let it flow the back, down the back of your neck. You can stretch your neck a bit, move your shoulders a little bit, just... Let yourself settle in. Feel yourself supported from the earth, suspended from heaven. And all the internal tensions can just release, let go. To the hips, backs of the thighs, backs of the <coughs> knees, calves, the heels, right into the earth. And then we go to the top again, and we're going to let, it could be warm oil, you imagine, perfumed oil, rose oil. But this time just let it flow right down the sides, release the tension in the temples, which comes from the jaws. Let the jaws drop. Let it flow across the shoulders, let the shoulders drop, one then the other, down the arms the elbows, the wrists, each finger, dripping off the fingers. And then from the underarms, over each of the ribs, across the waist, across the hip bones, down the sides of the legs, the ankles, into the ground. And now at this point, where you're completely plugged in, completely suspended and supported by the mercy and light of our Creator. When I was doing Qigong, I would start to do Qigong exercises. But one day I did this, I was about to do Qigong, and I got into the state of relaxation. And I went, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and I thought, SubhanAllah, I never prepare for the prayer like this. <laughs> so I invite you to say, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and mean it. One more time. Let's say, Takbir. Mean it. And one last time. Allah And then you can choose how you want to bring this energy you've received by opening up, releasing what is not useful and opening to receive can bring it to your heart, bring it to your heart and your stomach. You can say, no, I'm just going to go into a state of submission. But do you feel that maybe you'd be ready to face Allah and do Salat after doing this? Yes? No? So I hope it will be useful for you. I find that you can do this during the Adhan if it's okay, I don't know if that's acceptable, but to, you know, or just when you're thinking about doing your, your prayer, just, you can just very quickly just do a gozo. <laughs> because when you were saying, I was really, I thought of this, and I thought, oh, maybe I can say this. When you were talking about the Prophet Wasallam and he was in a state where he needed to cleanse himself, and the world presented itself to him, and 
It's like, oh, I need a grizzle. <laughs> you know? And I thought, oftentimes we're like that. The world is like in your face. And you go, whoa, I really need a guzzle, I need to clear, you know. So this is kind of a guzzle that you can do. And witness, and then face whatever it is you have to face in the world, inshallah. So. so When I came in, everyone was chatting. And I thought it's good if we have a little chat session again. Um, you can choose your subject, but I thought it would be good to speak to each other about what we will take from this weekend, how <coughs> we will somehow keep what we've been given, and remind ourselves and keep it going once we go out there. Hmm? And maybe say, just have an intimate conversation which doesn't have to be shared with anyone, but with the person you're with about what it's like for you out there at this point, what you're thinking of going to on Monday. And then hopefully there can be some sharing about what we can take from this weekend that will help us to more bro in our everyday life. I'm, I'm, I'm 69 years old, and I have been with people speaking about Tawheed for 45 years or something. And somehow I still separate, like, you know, there's that life, and then there's my path. And what I'm just beginning to come to is the fact that in practically every aspect of our life, but at least in these big ones, there's a time for everything, but Allah, you look to the east or the west, all you will see is the face of Allah. In the office, in the traffic, on the bus, on the tram, on the internet. Allah's face is there. Every face that comes to you is an aspect, an attribute of Allah presenting itself to you, giving you an opportunity to witness and to respond appropriately. And so these skills that we're learning here to actually take them into our everyday life so that we have the intimate presence and the witnessing of Allah's ever-present mercy and Rabb, you know, His generosity and His support and His guidance and all the attributes that we love from Him. We have them available to us every single minute of every single day, all of the time. So. How do we take what we've learned here into our life? And I think the main thing that's going to come up, I'm kind of hoping, is that, well, I'm going to use my prayer better. You know, I'm going to make sure I do them, make sure that I connect to what time of day it is. And that's just the last thing I want to say. One of the biggest gifts I was given, mother of five working, single mom a lot of the time, busy, always busy. I absolutely, supposedly human beings cannot multitask, but I absolutely can multitask because I can be thinking about 10 other things while I'm supposed to be praying. <laughs> you know? So, uh, mashallah. But it was Sheikh Asaf who just said to us in passing one time, he said, when it's time, like now, Sheikh Muslim has really, really helped me to just really kind of understand how to connect to the sun and know what time it is when it's time for the prayer. And I know that sometimes my being is kind of, I need something. Mm. And sometimes I think it's like a candy bar or a cookie or a coffee or something, you know. But I feel like I need something at certain times. And very often, it's actually time for the prayer. It's like what I need is a law. <laughs> So I just want to say that to you. It could be like that, you know. And maybe you're on the tram and it's time to pray. <laughs> or you're on your way picking up the kids. <laughs> or, you, you know, you've got, you've got a meeting in three minutes, you know. So what do you do? Hmm? And he said, 
when it's time to pray, when it's time for salat, pray. And as you said, it doesn't matter if you have shoes on, as long as they're not pig, but don't buy pig shoes anyway. <laughs> uh, doesn't matter if you have a belt on, doesn't matter if you're not even quite sure exactly where Qibla is, doesn't matter if in the situation you're in you cannot go into, you can't put your head on the ground, you can't, you know, even you might not even be, you know, find some dust. If it's time to pray, pray. And it's, I think it goes along with this instruction that if you're on your camel or you're in war, you still have to pray, even if the situation doesn't allow the proper salat. But it was a big gift to me. And he said, even if all you can do is lower your eyelids <laughs> for, your sajda, for your ruku and your sajda, pray, do salat, do it. And you'll have to make it up. You'll have to do the proper prayer later. But when it's time and you need it, give yourself that gift. Just connect. Come on. Remember. Allah's Rabb is here. I wanted to ask you to please tell us what namaz means. I, so just the meanings of the word salat and namaz, because I heard that you were saying you were saying namaz, you weren't saying salat. Yeah, uh, I was reading from the book in Urdu, and and the the use the, the word used both by Urdu speaking people and also Turkish speaking people and Persian speaking people for the time prayer is the word namaz, and the Arabic word is salat, and they both actually mean exactly the same thing. They both mean um, well, prayer. <laughs> so simply enough, they mean the same as du'a. Really, you know, we, we think du'a is is prayer. We pray to Allah. We ask of Allah. So actually, the original meaning of both the word salat, which is specific, has become used for a particular type of prayer, and the same goes <coughs> for namaz. It's become used for a particular type of prayer. But the actual meaning is the same. It's just prayer, like mm -hmm. calling upon Allah. Mm -hmm. That is the actual meaning. Okay, then I have to say one more thing. I'm sorry, and then we, we'll go on to speak to each other. Um, I studied the work of a man, Dr. Uh, Edward Bach. I don't want to tell a lot about his story, but he was ill, had some serious illness, and he discovered that if he spent time with certain trees and plants when they were blooming, that they would, he would feel better, he would be cured. But what was cured was his state, his emotional state. So he understood that, that nature is constantly making available to you the balance for the moment that you're in. <laughs> this is a way that Allah manifests to us. And so he ended up making <coughs> essences from the different plants and preserving them and make their little bottles. You can buy a set of 38 uh, bottles and if you're afraid in a certain way, you can take this essence and if you're afraid in another way, you can take this essence. If you're angry, you can take this essence. Um, so I was working with this one day with my patients, with my children. I've used them a lot with my children. And then I thought, well, you know, the divine names, I bet... The divine names are, have the same quality as the Bach remedies. That at any given time, if I'm feeling a certain way, there would be an aspect of Allah that would balance that situation in the moment. If I were just open to it, if I could just find out what it is, you know? So sometimes it's a salam or sabr. Often it's <laughs> sabr. But do you understand what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say? And, and what I discovered was that this turning to Allah is turning from whatever the problem is of the moment, whenever we kind of bump up against the world, because we agree that we've all created this imaginary physical world, we've decided that it's like this, and we have this picture of who we are relative to this world, and we've constructed it. It's a construct. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> you know? 
And every time it doesn't work, this idea of who you think you are, you feel uncomfortable. You feel afraid, you feel angry, you feel frustrated, you feel worried, you feel blah, blah, blah. Every time that happens, it's actually an invitation to turn away from your projection about what is going on 180 degrees and turn to the reality of Allah's presence in the moment to submit. And any time we do that, I'm sure you all have witnessed this, any time you do that, oh, oh okay, <laughs> things get better. <laughs> hmm? So you can actually even ask, you can turn and say, I don't even know how to turn to you. It's so bad. Allah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to ask for. Allah. I love that dua where you say, just open your heart without words. Because often it's, we don't know how, how to ask. We don't know which aspect of Allah's mercy we need right now. We just know that it's not going well and we're not managing. That state of divestment. I'm on the verge of giving up. I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't. I can't even go to work today. You know, I'm going to drop the kids off and I'm not even going. I can't do it. That state of divestment, can we call it divestment? It's like your cover. Your cover is blown. <laughs> Vestment has gone. Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Habib said, if you knew the value of divestment, you would want nothing else in the heavens and the earth. Because it's the biggest gift Allah can give us when He blows our cover and our story's not working so that we have to turn and submit to the truth of our utter helplessness and Allah's utter grace and power and mercy. Does that make some kind of sense? So that's the gift of the problems that we have. They're a friend of mine calls them dancing lessons from God, but they're just like new. You know that sign that says with the circle in it, don't go this way, <laughs> go that way. So literally most of the time you just have to turn 180 degrees, literally. And if you've been really working hard and struggling, you need to stop and rest. Or if you've been lazy and you haven't been bothered, then you need to get your butt moving and get going. You need to turn 180 degrees. You balance with the opposite is the rule in creation. You balance with the opposite. If you're feeling depressed and, ah, oh, I just, I have no energy and nothing works, I don't know where to get the energy from, and so, then, so you're like this, then you have to go. Does that make sense? Make sense? So what I'm saying is that when we say salat to him, da'imun, salat is du'a. It's turning in your helplessness to the source of whatever it is you could possibly need. It's going to come from Allah. So maybe that's a little clue about the inner secret of Salat. It's our turning, not knowing our helplessness, and turning to Rabb. 